to the parading of the colors, our national anthem, the recitation of old glory, and the posting of the colors. Detail, post the colors. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed had the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming I am the flag of the United States of America. My name is O Glory. I fly atop the world's tallest buildings. I stand watch in America's halls of justice. I fly majestically over great institutions of learning. I stand guard with the greatest military power in the world. Look up and see me. I stand for peace, honor, truth, and justice. I stand for freedom. I am confident. I am arrogant. I am proud. When I am flown with my fellow banners, my held is held a little higher 
My colors are a little truer. I bow to no one. I am recognized all over the world. I am worshiped. I am saluted. I am respected. I am revered. I am loved. And I am feared. For more than 200 years, I have fought in every battle, in every war. Gettysburg, Shiloh, Appomattox, San Juan Hill, the trenches of France, the Argene Forest, Anzio, Rome, the beaches of Normandy, the jungles of Guam, Okinawa, Tarawa, Korea, Vietnam, and in the heat of the Persian Gulf and a score of other places long forgotten by all, but those who were there with me, I was there. I led my sailors and Marines. I followed them. I watched over them. They loved me. I was on a small hill on Iwo Jima. I was dirty, battle-torn and tired, but my sailors and Marines cheered me. I was proud. I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of countries that I have helped to set free. It does not hurt, for I am invincible. I have been soiled, burned, torn, and trampled on the streets of my own country. And when it is done by those whom I have served in battle, it hurts. But I shall overcome, for I am strong. I have slipped the surely bounds of earth, and from my vantage point on the moon, I have been witness to America's finest hours. But my finest hour comes when I am torn into strips. to be used as bandages for my wounded comrades on the field of battle. And when I fly at half-mast to honor my soldiers, airmen, sailor, and marines, and when I lie in the trembling arms of a grieving mother at the gravesite of her fallen son or daughter, I am proud. My name is Old Glory. Long may I wave, dear God. Long may I wave. Detail, post colors. Amen. All right. You can be seated. This morning, of course, the 4th of July, you and I, as citizens of these United States of America, have been a very blessed people. And we know that this nation was founded upon the principles of the Word of God, the Bible. The founding fathers gave their lives to give us this nation, and so have so many throughout our years. We have been a free people, and we have inherited great bounties of blessings throughout the years. A perfect nation far from it but better than most. Can I hear an amen? amen? A gentleman by the name of Russ Walton, he was on staff during the years of the Reagan administration. He wrote a book, One Nation Under God, and he said this. He said, some years ago, he entitled it, Choose You This Day. He said, some years ago, a group of 120 self-proclaimed humanists hung a closed sign on the world. In their foreboding Humanist Manifesto 2, they intoned that God is dead. They ensured America that any search for divine guidance in these troubled times was an exercise in futility. A bunch of hokum, voodooism in the 20th century and 20th century garb. They said, No deity will save us. We must save ourselves, they shouted. That was their message of hope, their clarion call. 
Religion that places God above man does a disservice to the human species. That's what they said. Let us be your shepherds. That was their invitation. Well, for years, this nation has been wandering in their wilderness. Theirs and their cohort, the super state. And look, look where we are. The whirlwind we reap is not of God. It did not come from obeying the following of God. It comes from man cut loose from God, from man denying God, from man in disobedience to God, from man playing God. As a nation sows, so does it reap. If we would return as a nation to God and to His eternal truth, if we would rekindle the faith of our fathers, we could get out of the fix we are in, writes Walton. But the darker it gets, the louder the humanists and the statists propound their paganistic propaganda. Religion, they assert, is only an escape mechanism. We have heard that one before. Religion is the opiate of the people. Karl Marx came up with that one. Sorry, gentlemen, no sale. Our God is not dead. He lives. He reigns. We tried to warn you years ago. The unholy alliance of humanism and statism has always been a failure and will always be a failure. It was a failure in the French Revolution. It was a failure in the Communist Revolution. And it is a failure today in the Humanist Revolution. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. America, America, God shed His grace on thee. You and I as Americans need the grace of God to be poured out on this great nation. You see, the Bible declares where sin abounds, grace does that much more abound. And surely we are a sinful nation from the bottom of our feet to the top of our heads, from one east coast to the west coast, from the north to the south. We have engaged ourselves in every type of debauchery known to humankind. But if this nation would turn to God and repent of its sins, if this nation would turn from the foreign religions of this world, which have always revealed to us their failures, and we would return to God through Jesus Christ, our nation could be blessed once again. This morning I want to talk to you about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has saved us through His wonderful and incredible and amazing grace, and we have come to the faith. This is important. We have faith in God, but it is the faith of which we are saved. We are saved through faith in one person. His name is Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. He just eliminated all other religious systems, religious teachers, and all other ideologies. He says, if you want to go to heaven when you die, you must come to me. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. And so as we have come to Christ, we discover the ways of God. We discover the truth of God. We discover the life of God. And we try to share these ways, these truths, and this life with the whole world. Amen? See, we've come to the faith. It is not just, I believe in God. It is a faith that means, I believe with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength, I believe in God. That's the Christian life. We love God, and we love our neighbor as ourself with the love of God. That's the key. We hate no one. We have no meanness for anyone. We want every soul to be saved, no matter what sin they've been involved in. We 
will share with them the love of Christ, the goodness of God, the salvation of God, to bring them to salvation. No matter what religion or culture they're from, it makes no difference. Christ died for all humanity. And so we share. But we will not be brought under the dominion of tyrannical ideologies and false religious systems that will destroy this great nation. It is time for every American, let me declare this, for every Christian American to stand tall and strong and brave for the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Nobody tells us not to pray in the name of Jesus. We pray no matter what. For I read in our Bill of Rights that we have the right to the freedom of religion. We have a right to the freedom of speech. And nobody can tell us who or what we should or should not pray to. Pastor, you had too many cups of coffee. <laughs> no, I'm mad as heaven and I'm not going to take it anymore. Amen? Amen? We come to the faith. Let's fix our nation. I've heard some say we've lost the culture war. Well, I'm not in it for the culture. I'm in it for the salvation of souls. One soul at a time, giving their heart to Jesus Christ, this nation will be changed. Men and women standing up for righteousness, this nation will be changed. Every Christian going to the voting booth and voting righteously, this nation will be changed. God forbid we become complacent. I'm tired of serving the socialist. I'm tired of serving the communist. I'm tired of serving, uh, serving those who want to tax us to obliteration. You want to be their slaves? You go for it, man. But I'm going to stand up tall and fight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus tells us, if you want the nation to be fixed, you've got to come to the faith. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 he says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them. Oh, we can hear the sayings, my friends, but we've got to do them. We're all included. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm just trying to say we've got to be brave. Men of, and women of courage, not of fear and of failure. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as one of the religious people, scribes, the religious folks. We don't want to be religious people. We want to be Christ followers, Christian men and women. We believe in Jesus and we follow Jesus. Yes, even to the point of martyrdom. Oh, I don't have a death wish. Please don't misunderstand me. But truly, our heritage is full of the blood of the saints. The blood of the saints has become the life of the gospel, for it started with the blood of the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I must live by faith. David, the king of Israel, wrote in Psalm 11, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations of America are built upon faith according to the Word of God. There's a great author. His name is David Barton. If you want to find out about the true roots of America, Go to his website called Wall Builders, get his DVDs, get his writings, the, the Constitution, the original intent, and so forth, and he goes through the whole history of our founding fathers. It has been discovered 
that over 80% of the quotes of our founding fathers before 1820 80% of the quotes of our founding fathers before 1820 contain scriptural references or references to God. 80%. Don't tell me this nation was found upon a bunch of folks who were not Christians. It was James Madison who explained the nature of the American Republic when he said, we have staked the whole future of American civilization, not upon the power of government. Far from it, he writes. We have staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. Wow. I don't think we're founded upon a bunch of humanists, a bunch of atheists, a bunch of socialists, a bunch of communists. We were founded by men and women who were Christians. And they gave us this great nation and the great checks and balances that we as a nation and all nations need. In the book of Joshua chapter 1, if you want to turn there for a moment, I'll give you some insight on how to become a great nation. The theme of Joshua is victory through faith, in case you don't know. And here is the secret to the victories that God gave the children of Israel as they came against foreign enemies. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his, this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great sea, that would be in the Mediterranean, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Don't you love it? The Bible says, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong. Here you go, folks. This is America. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This is to be a land of opportunity, a land of prosperity. It should happen, and it will happen, as we go to the Word of God as God's people. He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in a day and night that you may observe to do it according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God has taken this great nation throughout the whole world, fighting for those who are less fortunate, fighting for those who have been oppressed, fighting for those who have been enslaved to tyrannical uh, governments. God has used this great nation to set the captives free. And we are not only a force for good, but we are a charitable people. We have reached out to lands far and wide and constantly helping them when it comes to that time of trial and tragedy. When it comes to the time where they need medicine or they need food or they need housing or they need orphanages or they need hospitals, who shows up first on their doorstep? America. We, the United States of America. Why are we always there first? Why are we always there giving? Because it's in our soul. It's been given to us by God, the God of the Bible, our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ who fed the multitudes with loaves and fishes, who gave us the principles of the Good Samaritan, who would pick up the wounded man on the side of the road and take him to a place of safety and security and then bandage him up and heal him. This is America. 
than the principles that we embrace, we have shared with the whole world. Folks, this is our foundation of faith. Our lives, according to the Word of God, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, you and I have a firm foundation, and it is built upon the rock, Jesus Christ, upon His Word that is unshakable and immovable. If we leave the Word of God and we leave Christ, we will build this nation upon sandy land. And it will erode right before our feet, and we will collapse, and great will be its fall. And right now, the world is watching us. Which way are we going to go? Are we going to step off the rock onto the sand, or will we step onto the rock and get more centered on the rock than ever before? Which way are you going to go? You and I need to get our feet on the most solid ground ever, which is God's Word. Many churches today are leaving the Word of God. Not this church, my friend. Not this church. You can steal our Bibles. You can burn our Bibles. You can burn the flag. But you cannot take Christ from our hearts. Faith's foundation is built upon what Peter said over 2,000 years ago, Thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. We believe in Jesus. He died for us, and He will take care of us. Let's take a quick look at America's history, just real quick. Proverbs 14, 34 says this, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We as Americans, we in the church, must repent of our sins and return to God and live righteously. That means we do the right things according to God. We have got to stop ripping each other off. We have got to stop being greedy in this nation. We have got to stop being lazy and expecting the government to keep printing money and we sit there in our easy chairs collecting all the checks and doing nothing. If you're out of work because you got laid up, please don't be offended. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the lazy bums that don't want to work. Amen? Okay, don't misunderstand me now. You know, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. I think God's pretty clear. When man sinned in the Garden of Eden, the first command of man was that he must work by the sweat of his brow. And a lot of people don't like to sweat. They don't like to work. So our government buys votes. More people out of work, the more they collect unemployment, the more they'll vote for those who are giving them the money. Now, I know we have a downturn in our economy and people are laid off because of jobs. What I'm trying to say is I'm talking about the lazy sluggard who doesn't want to work, and we need to pray that this nation get back on its feet once again. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What is the history of America? Let's check it out. Are you ready? Oh, we don't want to bring Christianity into America. We can't bring Christianity into the public school system. Why not? One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen? How can it be? Those songs we sang this morning, they need to be sung in every public school. They need to be sung in kindergarten all the way up. Why have they been removed, my friends? Think about it. Think about it. The socialists have been taking over the country over these last 40 years. We can't have people singing about God. We can't have them learning about the Christian roots of the founding fathers. If they do that, they will turn to God and they'll experience true freedom. We've got to enslave them. We've got to make them dependent upon us so that way we stay in power. We must make them dependent upon the state. Remove all vestiges of God from their minds and their hearts and their souls. You sing those songs, how do you feel? How do you feel when you sing God Bless America? How do you feel? Come on, what happens? There's something that happens in your spirit, doesn't it? There's something that makes you proud. There's something that moves your soul. So why would they want to remove this from our children? They don't want them to be proud of God. They don't want that God's blessing upon the nation because they want to be the tyrants. They want to be the rulers. They want to enslave the people so that they can become 
powerful and rich and control our lives. That's always how it is. If, you, if we're going to be a socialist nation, you better work for the government because they're the only ones that make it. You must understand this. I grew up with communist Russia, communist China. I grew up under the threat of nuclear bombs. They're still there. But they've taken on new strategies now. They've realized that a sense of capitalism brings more money to the government instead of the way of socialism. Our country's going the opposite direction. What is our history? Well, George Washington, our first president, said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Mm, that's our president, our first president, our founding father, George Washington. It is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. He wasn't a Christian? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, somebody should have told him, you can't use God in the Bible <laughs> as, a, as a government official. Boy, we've been hoodwinked, haven't we? You see, Adolf Hitler said, you tell a lie long enough and loud enough, the people will finally believe it. He knows. He knows. And he could be ruling the world right now if it wasn't for us. See, we knew a better way in World War II. We knew the way of freedom and liberty. It was Thomas Jefferson who said, if the people fear the government, there is tyranny, but if the government fears the people, there is liberty. Smart man. James Madison, the chief architect of the Constitution of the United States, author of the Federalist Papers, framer of the Bill of Rights, Secretary of State, the fourth president of the United States, once explained the nature of the American Republic. Republic, folks, republic. We're not a democratic form of government. We are a republic. He explained these words. He says, we have staked the whole of our political institutions upon the capacity for self-government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves. He says, he says this, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments. And then he added to that statement, he says, a watchful eye must be kept on ourselves lest while we are building ideal monuments of renown and bliss here, we neglect to have our names enrolled in the annals of heaven. Mmm. James Madison, good Christian man. He says the most important thing is you get saved in Jesus Christ. How about Patrick Henry, revolutionary general, legislator, the voice of liberty, ratifier of the United States Constitution, governor of Virginia. He says being a Christian is a character which I prize far above all this world has or can boast. The Bible, he says, is a book worth more and then all the other books that were ever printed. He says, righteousness alone can exalt America as a nation. Whoever thou art, remember this, and in the, thy sphere practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. The great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, my friend, and this alone that renders us invincible. Ah, okay, Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me what? Amen. That was Patrick Henry. Ah, here's a great lesson for you and I. Are you ready? Alexis de Tocqueville, a French philosopher who visited our shores when America was a new young nation. He came to the United States to learn about America and the people after we had defeated the mighty British Empire twice in 35 years. He looked for the greatness of America in her harbors and rivers, her fertile fields and boundless forests, mines and other natural resources. He studied America's schools, her Congress, and her matchless constitution without comprehending America's power. Not until he went into the churches of America and her pulpits aflame with righteousness did he understand the secret of her genius and strength. De Tocqueville returned to France and wrote, America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. He also said, the American Republic will endure, will endure until the day Congress discovers that it can bribe the public 
with the public's money. Let's have another stimulus bill. From Bush to Obama, bribing the public with the public's money. In other words, they're purchasing your vote as if this bill does not have to be paid one day. I don't know about you, but I love my kids, and I'm looking forward to grandkids, and I don't want them to be indebted for the rest of their life. What a cruel joke to play on our children. What kind of an inheritance is that? Well, it's their way of keeping themselves in power. He also said, the Americans combine the notions of religion and liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive of one without the other. Religion, that is Christianity, we're not talking all religions, folks. They only knew one truth, one way, one life. They knew the way of Jesus Christ and the Word of God, the Bible. They brought the two together. Christ brings liberty. He sets the captives free. It was Ronald Reagan who said, America was founded by people who believed that God was a rock of safety. I recognize we must be cautious in claiming that God is on our side. But I think it's all right to keep asking if we're on His side. Mm. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, whose God is the Lord. For letter F, we have faith's foundation is found in Jesus Christ and in His Word and doing them. We find for the letter A in America's history that righteousness exalts a nation and our founding fathers preached righteousness from the Word of God. We have the letter I, which is our declaration of independence. I'd like to find out how many of you this morning would like to be ruled under a global governance. Please raise your hand. Anyone want to be ruled under a one world governmental order? Hmm, seems to be unanimous here. Then why do we entertain the thoughts? I see that over 200 years ago, our founding fathers gave us what is called the Declaration of what? <laughs> and yes, independence. Today and forever. Why have they made us dependent upon foreign oil? Why are we not drilling here and drilling now, baby? Yeah. Drill now. Drill here. Why have we become dependent upon China for all of manufacturing and industry? Why have they sold our souls to foreign countries when we have a declaration of independence? My friends, we need to wake up and bring it home. Bring it home. What I see is they're using our petrodollars to kill us. It's pretty simple. Get a clue. It's time for a revolution, my friends. A revolution of heart and soul. Now listen, I'm not against the public school system, but I am for God in the system. It's time to get the Ten Commandments back on the walls. And if we want to have a cross in the Mojave Desert, God bless it. You know what I mean? Oh, that is so offensive. A cross in the Mojave Desert. <laughs> Gee, could it be more out there than any other place? <laughs> oh, no, you can't even have that. How about up in Alaska? Maybe some glacier way back there in the outback, you know. Oh, no, you can't have that. Somebody might see it flying over. <laughs> this is how ridiculous we've become. This is how much you and I must realize that the socialists have taken over the nation. What are we to do about it, Pastor? We pray. And we stand up for what is right. See, it's on our watch, folks. It's on our watch. This is happening on our watch. Abraham Lincoln he said, the people 
are the masters of both Congress and courts, not to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow the men who pervert it. Satan has two strategies that he's always used throughout human history. One is to divide from within, and secondly is to attack from the outside. Jesus said a house divided cannot stand. Now either we're going to become socialist or we're going to be Americans, founded and built upon the rock, Jesus Christ. America is to be a nation of independence, not a nation that is under the influence of the rest of the world. Russ Walton writes another aspect of God's bedrock of laws and freedom. He says, some see freedom as that state or condition in which the individual is released from all restraints, free of compunction or moral standard. To them, freedom is a no-holds-barred opportunity for the big rip-off and the easy ride. No obligations, no discipline, just freedom to do their thing and let the other fellow take the hindmost. Such persons are not libertarians, they are libertines. The product of their error is licentiousness. The Apostle Peter makes it clear that we are not to use our freedom, quote, as a cloak for vice, but as servants of God, 1 Peter 2.16. Paul tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, 2 Corinthians 3.17. Paul also cautions us to not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another, Galatians 5.13. Freedom, as Christians know it, is one of our precious gifts from God. Thomas Jefferson said, the God who gave us life gave us liberty. As with everything else God bestows upon us, writes Walton, we are to use his gift of freedom wisely in his service and in harmony with his laws. There are essentially two forms of freedom. There is spiritual freedom and there is physical freedom. Spiritual freedom is that personal inner state of being which comes through the Spirit of God. It is that internal freedom that breaks the bonds of appetite and greed that makes us servants of God rather than slaves of self or other men. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed, Jesus said in John 8, 36. There, that is true freedom. It is the freedom and the faith that overcomes and sustains even in the meanest state and the severest bondage as it did the apostles Paul and Peter. And so many of our fighting men were held long months and years in the utter degradation of enemy prison camps. The spirit of liberty remembers that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. The spirit of liberty is the spirit of him who nearly 2,000 years ago taught mankind that lesson it has never learned, but never has quite forgotten, that there is a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. Physical freedom is that outer state of the individual. The external condition, that is, the absence of force, the absence of coercion, the absence of restraint and constraint. Sociologically, freedom on the physical plane is man not playing God, either individually or collectively. To every man the right to live, to work, to be himself, and to become whatever thing his manhood and his vision can combine to make him. In other words, physical freedom is that condition, that situation in which individuals live harmoniously and do not seek dominion over each other. Freedom. A declaration of independence. Independence from the rule of the king in Britain and freedom found under the rulership of Christ. Independence. Then we have truth. Our nation must be built upon faith. Truth for the letter T. Truth goes marching on as you sang earlier. Joshua the great man of God, in chapter 24, verses 14 and 16, he said, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. 
Serve the Lord, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will what? We will what? Amen. Now listen, folks. This great lesson that Joshua shared with the children of Israel as they went into the promised land and they were victorious. He said, look, you must keep this in the forefront of your minds and your hearts. Because the moment you start serving the gods, these foreign gods, you'll be enslaved to their immoralities. You'll be enslaved to their sacrifices. You'll be enslaved and, and whooped, if you will, by other nations. And that's exactly what happened. And the truth of the matter is, we are seeing this in ourselves. We are not a nation that worships Allah, nor Buddha, nor Confucius. We don't worship Hindu gods. We worship the one true God, the one who gives us liberty, freedom from sin, the slavery of sin, the ability to do what is right in life. We don't worship the almighty dollar, God forbid. You see, folks, we need an army of men and women who will live for Christ, amen? You and I are those men and women who must live for Christ. This is the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When we look to the secrets of America's freedom, we find that a gentleman named Sir Alex Frazier Tyler. He lived from 1742 to 1813. He was a Scottish jurist and historian. He wrote the following. Now, please listen close in regards to truth, in regards to our nation. He says, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse of the public treasury. From that time and on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the results that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's great civilizations has been 200 years. These nations have progressed through this, this sequence. Now listen close to the sequence of the fall of a nation. Here it comes. They go from bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage. From great courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance. From abundance to to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependency, and from dependency back into bondage. Where are we right now as Americans? Where are we right now? I think we're getting close to bondage. I gave you on the back of your notes a summary of the Ten Commandments. And I also gave you on your notes a summary of the Communist Manifesto. The Ten Commandments represent God's government over man. God commands us for our own good to give up wrongs and not rights. To give up wrongs and not rights. His system always results in liberty and freedom. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are built on this foundation, which provides for punitive justice. It is not until one damages another's person or property that he can be punished. The Marxist system leads to bondage, and God's system leads to liberty. Read carefully. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. 
Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Directly above the chief justice's chair is a tablet signifying the Ten Commandments. When the Speaker of the House in the United States Congress looks up, his eyes look into the face of Moses, and it reads as follows. The Bible is the book upon which this republic rests. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, thus said. The moral principles and precepts contained in the Scriptures sought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. Noah Webster says, All the miseries and evils which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. Now, what is the summary of the Communist Manifesto? The Communist Manifesto represents a misguided philosophy which teaches the citizens to give up their rights for the sake of the common good. But it always ends up in a police state. This is called preventative justice. Control is the key concept. And so we read carefully. Number one, there is the abolition of private property. The abolition of private property. That which you own is taken away from you. Secondly, heavy progressive income tax. You're going to be taxed to obliteration, folks, and it's coming. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. You work hard your whole life. You've been taxed on what you've worked hard for your whole life, and now you want to give it to your kids, and yet the government comes along and takes 50% of it. Is that right? Isn't that double taxation? You worked hard. You paid your taxes. But that's not enough. They're going to tax you even after you're dead. Confiscation of property and all immigrants and rebels. Number five, a central bank. Number six, government controlled of communication and transportation. Seven, government ownership of factories and agriculture. Talk to the people in Venezuela right now and find out what's going on under Hugo Chavez. Why is Greece in such an uproar? Because they became a socialist country. Everybody was hired by the government, and now they can't pay their pensions. So they're rioting in the streets. They're upset. We need to learn the lessons. Government control of labor. Corporate farms, regional planning. Government control of education. Don't you dare talk about God in this public classroom. Hmm. Don't you dare mention Jesus at your valedictorian speech, even though he was your inspiration your whole life, and he was the one that led you in getting these great and wonderful grades that you worked so hard to attain. Don't you dare mention his name at this public gathering. My friends, is this America? We better wake up. You better realize that the socialists have taken over the country. To eliminate God is eliminating our freedom. To eliminate our worship of Christ is to eliminate our freedoms. It is a socialist state, and you need to wake up if you haven't already. Our men and women serving in the military are to take an oath to protect and defend what? Amen, my friend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution. Abe Lincoln was right. He says, watch out. When the courts and the government starts perverting the Constitution, we're in trouble. You and I need to realize what's going on within this country. You and I must stand strong. This country is for all people of all races, and we're all created equal. The founding fathers told us, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. You and I, all of us, equal as one. I like what, uh, I skipped the quote earlier, but I'll share it with you real quick. This gentleman, General Romulo, I hope I pronounced his name right, he was a general of the Philippines. You know what he said about America? He said this. He said, never forget, Americans, that yours is a spiritual country. Yes, I know you're practical people like others. I've marveled at your factories, your skyscrapers, and your arsenals. But underlying everything else is the fact that America began as a God-loving, God-fearing, God-worshiping people. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. And may we never stop. 
Finally, there is hope for tomorrow. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, folks, God is real simple. Don't you love it? He says, if you just turn to me and you humble yourselves as a people and you begin to pray to me and you turn from your wicked ways, you repent of your sins and you live for me now, he says, I will heal your land. Our land needs healing. We're getting hit with all kinds of catastrophes and diseases and so on and so forth. We need to be healed by God as a people of God. And I know it's a tall order. And many say, well, it's, it's, we've gone too far. We've crossed the bridge, Daryl. It's burned down behind us. We can't go back. It's done. Well, I'm sorry, my friends. I got something in me that my parents taught me years ago. And they told me that skinners aren't quitters. So I'm not going to quit. If you want to quit, you go right ahead. But I'm going to continue to pray for this nation. I'm going to continue to repent of my sins. And I pray you'll do the same. And we're going to live for Christ. Amen? Amen. Yeah, that precious song that we sang. In fact, I gave you our national anthem in the middle of your bulletin because I wanted you to read the rest of the words in the national anthem that we never sing. And our precious girls this morning, our sisters in the Lord, they uh, sang several, not all the verses, but several of the verses where it says, and in God we trust, amen? Did you know that that was in our national anthem? No, you don't know that. Why? Because the socialists want to bury it, my friend. They want to bury they want to remove in, uh, one nation under God from the Pledge of Allegiance. They want to remove in God we trust on our dollar bill. They want God removed from the nation. Let's wake up, let's wise up, and let's live for Christ. I'll end once again with this beautiful song. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies. It's called America the Beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern impassioned stress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy gold refine till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Catherine Lee Bates in 1893 wrote this poem, which became a song in regards to this great nation. And ask God's hand of blessing upon each and every one of us on this 4th of July. <laughs> 